let's get started with the first session of the day, which is basically about basics uh, of Riemannian geometry for robotics. So this is the first part of the basics that we're going to explain. Um, and let me get started with um, two simple examples, kind of to motivate a little bit why we are doing this. Um, so if this is too obvious for some of you, uh, I think this is fine. But I would like us to be all on the same page uh, regarding of why this actually could be relevant for, for any of us. So first thing uh, is the example about computing the mean on the sphere. So kind of the motivating example here is that we may have actually some data belonging to the hypersphere. And the hypersphere, roughly speaking, is just that set of vectors whose norm is actually one. Right, And this can be related, of course, to the unit quaternion that we use, we often use to represent orientation of rigid bodies in Cartesian space, OK? So um, if we want to actually compute the mean for um, a set of data points, so in this case, we have x1, x2, and x3, we can actually do this in different ways, right? So one could think that if we're working on the sphere, one way to do this is to use spherical coordinates. So to guarantee that we stay on the sphere, right? And if we do this, so here we have the representation of these points in spherical coordinates. And what we're gonna do is just to compute the mean. And what happens is that this is the mean that we obtain for uh, these three points using spherical coordinates. So there's no mistake here. This is actually the values. And as you can see, this mean actually is not in the support of the data, right? So there might be something off here, OK? One thing that might be off is that if you keep an eye on what is happening here, so these values are actually kind of encoding uh, angles that go from 0 to 2 pi. So 0 to 2 pi are actually the same point. Right, and this is actually not considered directly. If we compute just a mean including uh, using the standard Euclidean uh, tools. So we need to do something else in order to guarantee that this mean is actually the one that we need to compute. So the second thing that we could do is just to use the standard Cartesian coordinates, and if we do that, then of course now. Our mean is slightly better because it stays kind of close to the support of the data, but actually is not on the hypersphere surface. So it's kind of we are not fulfilling the constraint, the norm of the mean is equal to one, right? So what we can do simply or naively is to project this point to the sphere. So we take the vector and we just normalize it, right? So that, that, could, that could work. But actually, if we compute the real mean using Riemannian manifold tools, then we realize that actually that mean is a little bit off. So the one from the, that we compute using the projection over the Euclidean mean is a little bit off. This error here might look like not much, but when it comes to higher dimensional manifolds and manifolds that have more complicated curvatures than the sphere, this error can actually be dramatic, okay? so. This is one example of why it's actually important to keep in mind that uh, when handling data that belong to Riemannian manifold, we need to exploit and to consider the geometry in order to properly encode the information that these data uh, have. Okay. Another point is that by using actually the Riemannian mean, we actually are kind of um, coordinate invariant. So as you could see here, when we use spherical coordinates or Cartesian coordinates, actually, uh, by just using the normal Euclidean mean, uh, the means are actually very different. Second example. So let's move on to the manifold of positive definite matrices. So in here, the problem is that we're going to have is that we want to interpolate between positive definite matrices. And example of these are, uh, I mean, you can find a handful of these examples, but in terms of robotics, for example, we can have uh, ellipsoids of ell uh, ellipses or uh, inertia matrices or manipulability ellipsoids as well that actually can be represented by this set of positive definite matrices. So the idea here is that we want to compute the interpolation between two points 
on the cone of SPD matrices. So here we have one point X2 and the other point X1. We compute a linear interpolation using the Euclidean one here in blue or the remaining interpolation that is depicted here uh, by the red line, all right? And here it might not be extremely obvious like why this is not working in the Euclidean case. But if we have a look actually at the volume of, uh, of the two initial points that we have, so the two initial ellipsoids that we have, then uh, what we want to do is, for example, to keep an eye on the middle point of the interpolation and have a look at the volume of these two points. So we have here the midpoint for the Euclidean case and the midpoint of the interpolation for the remaining case. And here we have the values, right? For the Euclidean and for the Riemannian case. And what happens is that we want actually uh, to check the volume of the ellipsoids, which is basically proportional to the determinant of the, of the matrix. And by checking actually that, which is very easy to compute indeed for the two initial for the two initial points that we have for the interpolation, we actually realize that by using the Euclidean interpolation, the midpoint has a huge volume. It's a hundred compared to the two points that we have initially. While checking the one that we get from the Riemannian, it actually keeps the same volume during the interpolation. Okay, so that, that will tell us that you actually want to interpolate between two ellipsoids that have the same value. We don't expect the interpolation to just blow up in terms of the determinant of the, of, the, of the ellipsoid. So this again shows that there's something there when we use the Euclidean approaches over data that belong to a specific Riemannian manifold. All right. So I hope that these two simple examples kind of uh, convince you a little bit on the importance of using this Riemannian manifold theory for robotics. And now what I would like to do is to just mention some common Riemannian manifolds that we may find in different kind of robotic applications. So the first one, of course, is Euclidean space. Euclidean space is still a Riemannian manifold. It's easy, of course, for all of us. It's used to represent uh, positions, of course. Also forces and torques could be part of the, of the Euclidean space. And here there's not much new to, to say, right? But then we have the example that we had at the beginning, which is the sphere, which is all the set of vectors in Euclidean space whose norm is basically equals to one. Uh, and as I said before, this manifold is used to represent orientations. And uh, there's some recent work, for example, in learning from demonstration uh, that use this formulation in order to properly uh, learn patterns of orientation when it comes to, to learn, for example, motion skills. Um, another manifold that is of interest, uh, well, just to mention here, we have some, some references uh, because this manifold besides robotics is actually very, very, very commonly used in directional statistics. So for example, there are some uh, shape features uh, for images uh, or 3D uh, meshes that actually are encoded using these uh, unit vectors in high, higher dimensional spaces, okay? All right, so as a second example, we have the torus. And broadly speaking, we can think of the torus um, as a manifold that can be used to represent the space of joint configuration for a robot. This, of course, means if the robot doesn't have joint limits, okay? And the best example for that probably is the pendulum or double pendulum, right? So if we want, for example, to represent the configuration space of a pendulum, then we could think of using uh, the torus. The torus is basically just a Cartesian product of circles, right? So S1 or spheres of dimension one. And you can actually identify uh, what happens with the torus as uh, periodic functions um, when it comes to, to represent the pendulum behavior, okay? So this is also a very common uh, manifold that we can find out there. Probably a little bit less uh, familiar for some of us is the cone of uh, symmetric positive definite matrices. And this all means is that we're gonna consider a set of matrices whose eigenvalues are just greater than zero, okay? Examples of this, for example, we have uh, manipulability ellipsoids. So there are some approaches out there that we develop to learn uh, or to define controllers on the space of SPT matrices. 
We have also used this representation of this manifold to, for example, tune control gains like stiffness or damping matrices that belong to this manifold of SPT matrices. Um, and of course, covariance matrices of Gaussians can be also identified by this manifold. Even less familiar for some of us, the hyperbolic manifold. So the hyperbolic manifold can be just, um, I mean, it, it depends actually on which kind of model we have, and we're gonna go in more details about that later probably. But is for this case, which is the Lorentz model, which is the one that you observe here, which is a hyperboloid in 3D, basically the set of, uh, of vectors uh, in Rd plus one, whose norm basically, or the inner product according to the Lorentz model is equal to minus one. Why this is important. So you check what is happening out there in the machine learning community. This manifold has been recently used, for example, to represent hierarchical data. And it happens that this manifold indeed has very good characteristics because um, distances or basically like geodesics that uh, or paths that you can see here. Here actually we have the Poincaré ball, which is another representation of this hyperbolic manifold. And what it means is that we can actually represent the hyperbolic manifold either using the Poincaré ball or the hyperboloid Lorentz model. And these two, these two models are actually isometric. What I wanted to say before is that the benefits of using this, uh, this manifold in terms of representing hierarchical data comes from the fact that uh, the, uh, the paths be, uh, between, for example, very distant uh, um, points on the manifold will cross the center of it, or for example, like it's here depicted by this uh, red line. You want to compute the distance between these two points that, that, that could be, for example, uh, measuring the distance between two nodes in a tree. Basically, we have to go through the origin, so to speak, of the manifold. So this is a kind of a large distance. And this behavior uh, is actually very good when it comes to embed like very huge, uh, um, graphs or, or, or tree-like uh, graphs. And obviously there's not much there in robotics, but we actually uh, did a, a really nice paper with some colleagues that is actually under review, where we exploit these manifold to embed uh, robot taxonomies and to generate motion out of it. So you could check it out later. All right, so finally, uh, we have data-driven manifolds. So, so far I've been talking about manifolds for which we know the geometry beforehand is given, okay? And usually this facilitates a lot of the operations that we might need, but it may happen that we want to learn a manifold out of data. So maybe you have a reinforcement learning agent that is collecting data for a specific skill or specific task and you want to learn a manifold out of it. So that means basically you want to learn the Riemannian metric. We're gonna understand that probably later. And uh, what that means is that we're gonna exploit the distribution of the data to compute a so, I mean, kind of a so-called stochastic metric. So basically we're gonna use the variance and the uncertainty of this data to build our Riemannian metric and to understand actually this uh, data from a Riemannian manifold perspective. And we have two recent applications of this work. One of these uh, was basically using um, the manifold learned from data uh, to carry out some trajectory optimization for quadrature control. And another one that basically use uh, also demonstrations to learn a manifold for uh, robotic skills from which we can actually uh, represent the motion skills using the geodesics on this manifold that we learn. And with that, um, I will close the kind of review of main manifolds. And I'm gonna hand over to Noemi who's gonna explain to you uh, some of the main concepts. Uh, some questions so far? Yeah. You didn't talk about uh, SO strip and SO group and so on. Is there a technique? Um, that's, that's actually a good question and probably a disclaimer that I should have um, probably um, shared with you. So, true, um, we didn't talk about the SO3, but um, it's basically because, on the one hand, um, we prefer to represent here orientations using kind of a minimal representation, which is quaternions. So here we have only need, we need only four uh, components, so to speak, uh, against the components that we might need for SO3. And uh, we are gonna, we're not gonna cover like Lie algebra topics here. Why not? Uh, I mean, these two theories are actually very linked, 
but uh, in our experience, the Riemannian Marfil theory generalizes more for not only like um, the motion, for example, of a rigid body that can be represented in SC3 and for which we can use a lot of Lie algebra tools. But here, for example, we can use uh, hyperbolic manifolds, relevance manifolds, and so on and so forth. Notice, no, is, that doesn't mean that we cannot use Lie algebra for some of them, but we prefer to stick to the Riemannian manifold theory as a more general way to understand the manifolds. Yeah. But when it comes to orientation, we are going to talk about the quaternion part. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, hi everyone, and welcome from my side as well. It's actually super cool to that room that crowded. I think we were not expecting that. So, yeah, thank you for coming, really. Um, so, here my goal is to give you a brief introduction on the main concept of Riemannian geometry. Um, as Leonel said, I'm going to try to be as intuitive as possible, so maybe not always super formal. Um, yeah, this is just to give you a better intuition and not to stick too much to the mathematical books. Um, so if that changes, okay. So first of all, I would like to do a small detour uh, through curvature to introduce you to this concept. So at school, I think all of us, we learn geometry. And usually when we learn geometry, we start with points, with lines. Then eventually we move a bit to parametric curves in 1D. So here we, we have a curve gamma that is parameterized by a single parameter S, which is a scalar. So when you move S, for example, from zero to one, you move along your curve. Uh, what we learn also here is that the velocity of those curves are given by the vector at, that is tangent to the curve. And that finally, you can fully characterize the curve by a notion that is called curvature. So curvature tells you basically how much the curve is bended, and it's equal to one over the radius of the oscillating circle, right? The circle that is tangent to the curve at this point. Um, this curvature is also given by the acceleration of the curve, the norm, the norm of the acceleration of this curve when the curve goes at velocity zero. So this is one of the concepts we usually learn in geometry. Another one is that we go from a straight line here in 1D to something that is whoops, higher dimensional. Um, so we have Euclidean spaces of higher dimension, and then we learn to compute areas, to compute volumes of shapes, and all that kind of things. The question that we want to address here is how do we go basically combining those two concepts in higher dimension? So in other words, when we have curved space that are higher dimensional, 2D or more, how do we actually describe the geometry of those curved space? So for example, if we have curves on those manifolds, like how do we characterize those curves? What are their velocity? How can we measure their length? How do we measure angles between um, vectors in these spaces? How do we measure areas and volumes on those curved spaces? So basically our question is, um, how do the geometrical properties of our curves and of our Euclidean spaces are generalizing to those curved spaces of higher dimension? Um, so the first thing that we have to observe in that kind of case is that there are some very simple um, axioms that we observe in Euclidean space that actually are not applying anymore. So just as a reminder, if you're in Euclidean space, let's say I want to go from that point to that point, I think you all know that the fastest way, the shortest path between the two is just to go straight, right? This is really obvious. Another thing that is very obvious is if we have a line, um, this line L, and we have a point P, you can always find another line that is parallel to L and that goes through P. And this notion of parallel line is that they are never going to intersect. Even at infinity, they don't intersect. And finally, you have triangles. You know that if you sum the angles of any kind of triangle, the sum is 180 degrees. So now when you go to the curve space, none of this is applying anymore. So it means the shortest path are not straight line anymore. They are curved and they're called here geodesics. And the parallel axiom is not respected anymore, which means that we don't necessarily have parallel lines and the sum of the angles of a triangle are not necessarily 180 degrees. So taking an example, if we take again our sphere, um, if you go, you want to go from a point P here to another point, for example, here, actually the shortest path is not a straight line because if you have a straight line, you're actually going through your sphere inside of it and you want to stay on the surface. So the shortest path is actually 
the, the segment of line that is going on uh, a great circles. So you can think of the great circles as uh, the longitude lines on the Earth, for example. Um, another point concerning the parallel, if you have, for example, this line, which is here, the equator, and you would like to find a great circle that is parallel to the equator passing through P, this is actually not possible. Any great circle that passes through P is gonna intersect this equator line in two points. So in that case, here and there. And finally, if you consider triangles on curved surfaces, so here we have a kind of uh, vegetables that has different curvature. So if you see in that part of the vegetable, the sum of the angles of the triangle is higher than 180 degrees, and in that part is actually lower. So this doesn't hold anymore. Okay. Um, so basically, in order to characterize those curved space, we're going to resort to Riemann, uh, to differential geometry, or then more specifically to Riemannian geometry in our case, which is basically the application of calculus to the geometry of a space which is curved. So this is what we're going to study now. Um, so the first very important concept is the concept of Gaussian curvature, which, as we're going to see, is basically something that, as the curvature for a curve in 1D, is going to entirely characterize the intrinsic geometry of our surfaces. So this Gaussian curvature is also called intrinsic, total curvature, or just simply plain curvature. Um, it's given as the product of the so-called principal curvature. So this is our Gaussian curvature, our principal curvature, and those principal curvature can be very easily obtained for any kind of surface. Basically, what you do is that if you have one point on your surface, you take the normal to that point, and then you take a plane that is passing, that is englobing this normal vector and passing through your point here, here. So this is one example of those planes. This is another example. And for each of those planes, you take the intersection between the plane and your surface here. So this is this line. And the curvature uh, of those lines, then you obtain all of them. You take the minimum one and the maximum ones, and those give you your principal curvature. Then you multiply them and you obtain the Gaussian curvature. So just to show you a couple of examples, uh, here we have a space that is hyperbolic. So we have this point P, this is a saddle point. And you see that one of the line of the principal curvature has a positive curvature, the other one a negative curvature. So when you multiply them, you have a negative Gaussian curvature. So this applies to all the hyperbolic spaces. As another example, we have the sphere or any spherical spaces. Here you see that the sign of both principal curvature are the same. So we have a positive curvature for the sphere. Then we can go to cylindric or flat-like space where one of the curvature is actually zero. This is a straight line, zero curvature. So the curvature of the space is zero. And this is the same if you take uh, basically a plane, right? The plane, the two curvature are zero. So what is actually very interesting here to see is that this Gaussian curvature is really intrinsic. So you see that those two spaces have the same curvature. And this is because you can simply go from one of those spaces to another one by bending the surface. OK, so if I take my plane, I just bend it. Then I get uh, my cylindrical like thing. So it's actually the same surface. I just bended it in a different shape. However, if you want to go from this surface to this one, you need to distort, to cut, to stick, or anything else in order to get to go from here to there. So the surface is not the same, you modified it, okay? So this is why our curvature is changing. So those two have the same intrinsic properties and they are different from those. So this is one of the first and most important results in differential geometry by Gauss and it's called the Theorema Egregium. So Gauss found that this was um, like a super cool result. So this actually means in English, a totally awesome theorem. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so this applies for uh, surfaces that are embedded in the Euclidean space of R3. Now we would like to go generally for curved spaces that maybe are higher dimensional uh, or any other things. So then we move to the concept of manifold, which is then more generic. So manifold, roughly speaking, is a topological space that locally looks Euclidean. So I'm not going into details of topological space, but assume it's a mathematical space. And locally Euclidean, it means that simply we can define this notion of a chart it means that you can take a neighborhood here on your manifold and you have a one-to-one -one map to a local neighborhood of the Euclidean space. So it means that you have a, so this is a homomorphism mapping, which means that it's a continuous mapping, which is bijective. Okay, so you can map your points of this neighborhood here 
to a Euclidean space. What is cool here is that in Euclidean space, we all know how to do calculus. So you can map your point to Euclidean space. You can do any kind of calculus that you want, length, angle, areas, whatever you want. And then you can map back the result to your manifold. Um, here we would like to do calculus not only on local part of the manifold, but on the full manifold, ideally, right? So we need to define this notion of atlas, which simply means that we have a set of those charts, which are covering not only a local um, space, a local neighborhood, but by counting all the charts, we are covering at the end the full manifold, right? And finally, we would like to be able to have consistent calculus on the manifold, which means that we, when, when we have charts that are overlapping, like uh, here we have two different charts, they are overlapping here, we need that the calculus that we do on this chart and on this one is consistent where they are overlapping. So for that, we need smooth maps between the charts, like here. And this allows us then to have a consistent calculus over the full manifold. Um, one important concept in smooth manifolds in general, so yeah, sorry, didn't say that. So a manifold that is satisfying this property is called a smooth or differentiable manifold. This is really important, okay? So one important concept on the smooth manifold is the concept of tangent space. So for this, let me first define um, tangent velocities. So when you have a curve on a smooth manifold, you can define um, a tangent vector informally as the velocity of the curve at a point. So you have your curve gamma, you take the velocity of this curve gamma at x, which is uh, gamma dot, and this is a tangent vector. Then you can take the set or all those possible velocity you can obtain, and this gives you actually what the so-called tangent space. So the tangent space is Euclidean. You can kind of think about it as having a chart at each of the points on your manifold, which means that you can do all your Euclidean operation on this uh, tangent space, right? And then if you take the, the set of all the tangent space, you obtain the so-called tangent bundle. So this is actually crucial to then do calculus uh, on manifolds because you map things from the manifold to the tangent space, you do your calculus there, and then you can map back. So based on this, we can finally introduce the concept of Riemannian manifold. So Riemannian manifold is a smooth manifold and the tangent space of this manifold are equipped with a smoothly varying uh, inner product. Um, so it means that when you have two vectors on the tangent space of a manifold, you can define an inner product between those two vectors, as you can see here. Importantly, um, those two vectors are in the tangent space and the inner product is defined depending on where you are on your manifold. So here we are at the tangent space as X. So the inner product depends on X. You can also write this inner product in that shape where this is the so-called Riemannian metric tensor. So the inner product gives us this notion of Riemannian metric, okay, which is through this inner product. So the Riemannian metric tensor is a matrix that is symmetric, it's positive definite. And uh, this is actually what is gonna characterize the intrinsic geometry of our manifold everywhere. So if you know your metric, you know your geometry, and then you can have everything that you need. So any kind of notion of length, any mapping between tangent space and manifolds, they are defined based on that Riemannian metric. So it really gives you all your intrinsic geometry. Um, and uh, I told you before that for surfaces in R3, the curvature was um, defining the complete geometry on the manifold. And actually you have a, a mapping between the Riemannian metric and the curvature. So they correspond to one another in the case of surfaces in R3. But here, this is more general because it works for any dimension and any kind of Riemannian manifold. Um, so importantly, this metric is smoothly varying. So when you change tangent space, the metric uh, is smoothly varying as well. Okay, and it fully captured the intrinsic geometry of the manifold. Um, so as I told you, this allows us to compute the concept of length and distances. So first going for the concept of curve length, just to remind you how you do that for parametric curves in Euclidean space, you have your curve, you have your velocity at each point of the curve and the length of the curve is the integral from zero, so from the beginning to one to the end of your curve of the norm of your velocity. The generalization to, Euclid, uh, to Riemannian manifold is quite straightforward. You do exactly the same, but you replace the norm by the Riemannian norm. And this Riemannian norm is based on the Riemannian near product that I just showed you before. 
So it's the same principle, okay? Here you take your velocity, which is in the tangent space, you integrate it along your curve and you obtain the length of the curve. The notion of distance is relatively the same. So in Euclidean space, you know that um, basically the distance between X and Y is actually um, the length of the shortest path between X and Y, which in Euclidean space is um, straight lines. So you take your straight lines, which is, um, so basically the distance corresponds to the length of the minimum length curve between X and Y. So in Euclidean space, we have this very simple uh, formula. On Riemannian manifold, we don't have it, but it's the same principle. Actually, the distance is the length of the minimum length curve between two points. So in this case, it's the red curve, okay? Um, this is an important concept. So actually the constant velocity curve that have that minimum length, they are called geodesics. And this is an important concept in Riemann manifold because it, it generalizes the concept of constant velocity straight lines to Riemannian manifolds. So geodesics, they are actually um, curves that have a zero acceleration. Okay, so uh, they, are, they are constant velocity curves. They are curves that are minimizing the energy of the curve, so the kinetic energy of the curve that is given um, in that way. And because they are minimizing the energy, they are also minimizing the distance between two points. So if you want to go with a minimizing distance from X to Y, you follow a geodesic. Um, and as I told you, they're equivalent to constant velocity straight lines in Euclidean space. So you can see that uh, if you take it, for example, in that shape, you go from the point X here to the point Y here, and this is the, the shortest path. So you take a rope, you straighten it, and you, you wrap it around your surface. And then when you take it out, you actually have a straight line. So you can see it as um, a straight line in the manifold as seen by a small entity that is living on the manifold, if you want. Okay. Um, how to compute this? So there is the so-called geodesic equation, which is given here, which allows you to always compute your geodesics. This equation depends on the acceleration of your curve, on the velocity of your curve here, and on the so-called Christoffel symbols. So the Christoffel symbols, and this is the formula, you can see that they are depending only on the Riemannian metric. So it's what I told you before. If you have your Riemannian metric, this is sufficient and you can compute any notion of length and any kind of geodesic on your manifold. Um, this is also the equation that tells you that you have a zero acceleration actually. And you can usually write that with Einstein notation. So I just put it for people who are more familiar maybe with Einstein notation, I won't go into detail here. Um, so as you can see here, we have a system of N ordinary differential equation. So N is the dimension of the manifold. And if you solve that system, you're actually obtaining your geodesic curve. This also allows us to define those mappings that I briefly told you about between tangent space and manifold. So here, if you have um, an initial position X, an initial velocity V that is laying on your tangent space at X, you can use the so-called exponential map to map this velocity to a point on the manifold. You can see that as you have an initial position X, an initial velocity V, and you shoot a geodesic, and you see where it arrives on the manifold after time one. So it arrives at that point Y. So this is actually equivalent to taking your geodesic equation and to solve it as an initial value problem where you give initial position and initial velocity. The inverse mapping is called the logarithmic map. So in that case, you have a point on the manifold and you would like to know which initial velocity you have to apply in order to arrive at time one into that point. Um, so in that case, it's the inverse problem. You have an, in an initial point, a final point. So you take your geodesic equation and you solve a boundary value problem. And you go here from the manifold onto the tangent space. This is again gonna be useful uh, for doing calculus. You'd have points on the manifold, you move them to the tangent space with a logarithmic map. You do your calculus on the tangent space and then you move things back with the exponential map. Um, so in general, this is a problem that is harder to solve because boundary value problems are generally harder to solve than initial value problems. But uh, which is good for us is that there is closed form solution of those maps that are existing for most of the manifolds. So all the manifold that Leonel introduced you before, there is closed form solution and the operations are actually very simple. The last operation that I want to introduce you is called the parallel transport. So this allows us to move vectors between tangent space. So as I told you before, a vector here is really linked to a position. A, a velocity vector belongs to a single tangent space. So you cannot just go um, move it as you want and then use it in another tangent space. You have to move it formally. So here you want to move those vector u and v to the tangent space at x 
to the tension uh, from X to the tension space at Y. Um, so for that, we use the uh, parallel transport operation, which moves the vector across tangent space and conserves the properties of those vectors. It means that it conserves the remaining inner product, um, and roughly speaking, that conserves actually angles between those vectors. So the angle here is the same as the angle here, and um, yeah, all the properties of those vectors. Um, so you compute this again by solving a system of ordinary differential equation. And uh, not going into detail here, but it only depends again on your Riemannian metric. So your Riemannian metric really gives you everything. And for a known manifold, you again have very simple um, equations of that. So you don't need to solve the system anymore. There is a close from solution. Okay. Um, so just the last slide, I think this goes back to the question of Riemannian manifold versus Lie group that we had before. So I just want here to tell you the differences and uh, maybe why we shouldn't just think that they are the same thing, because this is a mistake that is often done, uh, especially I think in robotics. So both Riemannian manifolds and Lie groups are smooth or differentiable manifolds. The difference here is that the Riemannian manifold is endowed with a Riemannian metric that tells you everything about your manifold. You have a tangent space that is defined at each point. And all the operation, especially exponential, logarithmic, map, parallel transport, they are defined from the metric. Okay. A Lie group instead has a structure of a group. It means that you have all what you need usually in a group in mathematics, so associativity, identity element, inverse element. Usually we use a single tangent space that is defined at the origin, which is called the Lie algebra, which is also um, Euclidean. And here, the exponential maps and all this. So the exponential map corresponds to the matrix exponential, logarithmic map to the matrix logarithm. Um, yeah, and we don't have here a Riemannian metric. What we can do is actually endo a Lie group with a Riemannian metric, and then it's both a Lie group and a Riemannian manifold. Okay, but in general, those concepts are different. So today we are going to be rather on that side. Okay. And I think it's a bit more general as you can endow your Lie group as a Riemannian metric, so you can always consider things as Riemannian manifolds at the end of the day. Um, okay, just, I will give you quickly some references. Um, so these are some books. The slides are gonna be available later, so you can check those books a bit um, yeah, deeper later. I just display them here. Um, these are some uh, classical mathematical references some more applied references here on statistics and on optimization. Um, and this is the book that we use for some of the illustration of the presentation. And finally, some geometric libraries. So we have here Manopt, uh, which is for optimization, Geopt and Reobjects for stochastic optimization manifolds, Geomstats for statistics on manifolds. This is a Julia manifold that gives you a library with all the operations on the manifolds, Litorch for the groups, um, geometric kernel for kernels on manifolds, and finally Stockman for uh, computation on manifold learned from data. Um, so with that, I would be happy to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The crystal symbols only depend on the metric. 